knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're wrapping up 1 Corinthians. We've only got uh, today, next Sunday, perhaps the last Sunday in July, and we will tie this letter together. My plan is right now that when we have finished 1 Corinthians, and God lets me live, we will finish 1 Corinthians. To begin a series that's a little different than one we have done in, in quite a while. Uh, looking at the one another's in Scripture. Showing us how we build community as the body of Christ. But today, looking in 1 Corinthians uh, verses 12, chapter 16, verses 12 to 18, really focusing today on verses 12 and 13, pardon me, 13, 12, 13, and 14. Find that in your Bible, if you would, as we're thinking the overarching theme, theme, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. And today, this call to spiritual maturity, another way you might say it, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, after everything he's dealt with them about in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 15, uh, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. And we need to hear that, don't we? Because if ever there was a day in our country when immaturity is put forth as heroism, that is the day. When snowflakes are regarded as the wise among us and those who are sure of truth are regarded as the fools among us, it is the day we live in. And if we're not careful... We as a church will unwittingly drift into the snowflake culture. Everything will offend us. Everything will trigger us. We'll go around singing, poor me, poor me. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Yet the call in Scripture is the exact opposite. As we read earlier today about Uzbekistan, the nonsense playing out in the West today would be laughed at in Uzbekistan. Just as over 20 years ago when I stood before pastoral students training to be church planters in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia. They scoffed when I told them the condition of the church in the West more than 20 years ago. So let us hear this today. Stand with me if you would and follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. We want you to see, uh, in addition to hearing, to see the Word of God. Faith comes this way. Paul says in verse 12, chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have made up for your absence. For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. What have we read today? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us from these verses that we need to grow up and keep growing up till we get to glory. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you verse 12 when we looked at it in the previous section, sort of a bridge verse. He's, uh, he's about to send the letter off. Timothy will be carrying it along with some others with him. Apollos, Paul wanted Apollos to go. Uh, but Apollos, who's a, who's a grown man in the Lord himself, who, who also follows the witness and leadership of the Holy Spirit, just as Paul does, determined that this was not the time for him to go, that he needed to stay in Ephesus and labor there, uh, pressing the advance of the gospel there that was going on. 
what his attitude was at the right time, I plan to go uh, to Corinth. And, and so it's with that in mind that Paul, one spiritually mature believer, explaining why another spiritually mature believer will not be in the company of those going, uh, this letter unfolds as it closes. You see, the greater part of 1 Corinthians has been in the form of rebuke and correction. If we were to go back and do the catalog again, we've done it several times through the study, rebuking them for, for their uh, divisive spirit, their party spirit. Uh, one said, I think Paul's a better preacher than Apollos. I like him better. Some said, I like Apollos better. And, and some said, well, I like this. And, and they're choosing sides. It's okay to admit that the Lord has used a pastor to bless your heart, but the but they're just instruments. They're just instruments. And preachers should never be played one against another. In fact, I've learned in my life when I meet somebody, but it's a, perhaps it's a guest or somebody on the street, and they start talking, uh, saying kind things to me at the same time saying unkind things to another preacher about, it, about another preacher. Mm -mm. It's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. We need to learn. Rejoice and thank God. But being divisive about who your favorite preacher is, that's not edifying. And it's certainly, certainly, if this man you're talking about is a man of God, it's not something he would ever want done in his name. The attitude of a gospel minister is that of George Whitfield. Let the name of Whitfield perish. So when Wesley was starting the Wesleyan movement, Whitfield's followers came to him and said, we would like to start a movement like Wesley has started. And we could call it the, the Whitfieldian Society. And George Whitfield, who labored with Wesley in the First Great Awakening, said, let the name of Whitfield perish. Let the name of Jesus Christ live forever. So he addressed their carnality also, that they were, they were acting like children. In fact, that's the, that's the description of it. Was, you know, I'd, I'd like to feed you something more mature believers handle, but you, you can't handle it right now. They were tolerating immorality, remember, uh, and seemed to be gloating about it. That they, Look how loving we are. We are so loving that an incestuous man can be among us and, and be at home, perfectly comfortable, perfectly at ease. They were taking one another to court, suing one another, bringing reproach on that, on that one Christian church in all of Corinth, and they were suing one another. Now, they had wrong ideas about marriage. You just go on down the list, you remember them. Christian liberty, didn't understand it. Lord's Supper, they were abusing it. Spiritual gifts, they were abusing them. The resurrection. All those up to 14 questioning their behavior, their conduct as unbecoming that of Christian. Chapter 15 is the doctrinal section. Arguably one of the most critical doctrines of Scripture. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and therefore the bodily resurrection of all who follow him. And they were questioning that. So chapter 16, he challenges them. Grow up. I want you to see, you may not recognize, it may not be obvious in the English text, but in verses 13 and 14, there are five imperative verbs. Five verbs of command. Without getting too deep in the weeds in the, in the Greek, and in, in English as well, you just don't spot it in English. In the Greek, there's what's called the indicative. It's just the statement of fact. But there's also the imperative, the verb of command. When it comes, it's not a suggestion, it's not an observation. It's a command. And we're going to see these five commands. We'll dig into them today. Be watchful. Stand or, or be firm. Act like men, that is, be mature, be strong, be loving. I want to read those two verses to you again. Uh, just point it out to you. 
Be watchful. It's a command. Stand firm in the faith. Command. Act like men. Command. Be strong. Command. This one's not so obvious, but if you can see it in the Greek, it is, a, it is an imperative verb. Let all that you do be done in love. So first of all, be watchful. He says in, in verse, opening up verse 13. Be on the alert. Uh, when, you find, when you trace this word throughout the New Testament, the Greek word for it, to watch, be awake, be vigilant, be alive. It's the, it's the term Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 5.10. He calls upon them to, to wake up. In Ephesians, to wake up. Sleepy Christians, lethargic Christians. It's used 22 times in the New Testament. It's a call to be alert, be awake. As opposed, if you were looking for a, a, the opposite of it, to be indifferent or listless. And if you were going to describe the spiritual condition at Corinth, Indifference and listlessness would be a fair description. They were in a spiritual and moral stupor. How else? How else can you describe a congregation that can sleepily allow immorality in its midst? It's not a stupor. Even a physical stupor. Paul said they were getting drunk at the Lord's table. They were, they were not even on their edge then. So you can't say that the Corinthians were alert. And that's first Paul's first exhortation to them, his command to them. You need to be alert. Wake up. Let me tell you something. One of the dangers we face in the West is because we are not being hunted down like dogs yet, for our, for our relationship with Jesus Christ because we are not having our buildings burned down yet is so we can get complacent. Little sleep, little slumber, little folding of the hands. And those things that ought to be most meaningful to us, Bible reading, prayer, Gathering with the Christians when they gather. Either go through the motions, just become routine, or become easy to neglect. Complacency. None of us in this room are immune to this. Peter warned in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If you're not aware, the enemy of our souls wants to devour me. The enemy of our souls wants to devour you. He wants to devour your children. He lives, Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, to kill, steal, and destroy is M.O. Anytime you see division in a church, somebody, at least one party, is being taken captive by the enemy of our souls to destroy. That's how he operates. Peter says, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We need to be alert to Satan's strategies. You want me to help you there, Matt? Boys, boys, look at me, listen to me. Yes, sir? Thank you. Be alert, be on your guard. Be alert for temptation. We sing a hymn, Yield Not to Temptation, for yielding is sin. And yet, the lure is there. It's worked. 
Some of you are fishermen. You know what the fish like, what they'll bite. The enemy of our souls is like that. He knows. There's, there's things that he could drop in front of me, be impervious to me, wouldn't be to you. And there's things he could drop in front of me that would tempt me sorely, that might not n nudge you at all. We need to be alert. As I said earlier, we need to be alert to apathy and indifference. You see, there's a, there's a danger because we're not pressed, because, we're, because we don't walk out of here wondering, will the authorities meet us outside? Will this be the last time we'll be allowed to gather? Not the church in China thinks has to deal with that. Will this be the last time we'll see our pastor and his wife? Will this be the last time we'll meet in our building? Will it be destroyed when we leave? Or will they just destroy it while we're in it? I mean, that's how they live. And because we don't live that way, we can become apathetic, indifferent. I know, I'm not, yeah, there's a, there's a big banner back there to say the Haitians, and we know that the Haitians are going through a lot of trouble there, a lot of violence in their country. So glad we don't have that in our country yet. And, and they don't really, they don't, they don't need my signature on that. I mean, what, what difference will it make for me to say something to them? Well, we got the word this week that now they're starving that our brothers and sisters in Christ, in Dajan, Haiti, and the precious little orphans we're trying to care for, are starving. We don't even identify with that. And because we don't, it's just easy to get complacent. Just rock me in the hammock of ease. And the devil doesn't care, by the way. He doesn't care if he has to hunt you down to kill you to silence your witness or if he discovers that you're perfectly content to be in a hammock and just rock away the hours and the days and the weeks and the months and the years and turn into a, a spiritual rumple still skin, just sleep time away. It doesn't matter to him. Either ditch gets you. Either ditch gives him a measure of victory. Jesus said to one of the seven churches, to the church at Sardis, if you remember in Revelation 3, 1 to 3, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you'll not know what hour I come upon you. The thief will come in Revelation 1 through 3 to steal the witness of the church. You can't disregard the Lord's word. I think it was John MacArthur who said in his commentary, when his word is indefinite to us, when we're kind of just, kind of just reading the scripture, kind of just not feeding upon it, not Bible intake like we studied some time ago on Sunday evening, if we become, if his word is indef indefinite to us, we will become indifferent to it. So the call comes to Jesus, keep my word, repent of not valuing it. We need to be alert to false teachers. Be sure there's not a false teacher in this pulpit. Be sure that you check what I tell you from the scriptures. Doesn't matter how long a man is taught or preached, we're seeing people almost daily, people that I've, I've commended their works to you fall by the wayside. Some young, some older. People waffling, saying, well, now, wh where exactly in the Scripture does Jesus condemn homosexuality? I just can't find it. And so I want to be careful about, about calling it out and not, uh, Beth Moore said, and not go beyond the scriptures in calling homosexuality a sin. Your pastor, I love you. If you're reading Beth Moore, put her down. She's gone. There's only a few shades of difference between her and Joyce Meyer now. False teachers. It's a shame. 
denominations welcoming things that were unspeakable, unthinkable, not many decades ago. We need to be alert to that. We need to be wise to that. We need to recognize that, that we're, if we're going to be watchful, we've got to pray. We, we read earlier in Ephesians 6, with all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit, with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance. Praying for one another, praying with one another. It's great to pray for one another. We should do that. We, that should be something that's worked into our, the very warp and woof of our lives. You should be able to know that your Sunday school teacher is praying for you, that your pastor is praying for you, that your deacon is praying for you. But there's, there's a move beyond that. It's valuable beyond measure, and that's to pray with one another. We offer that opportunity on Wednesday evenings, to pray with one another, to be alert, to persevere. Well, to be watchful for the Lord's return. When the Son of Man comes, will he find such faith on the earth? Jesus said to his disciples, watch and pray, for the hour is near. And he doesn't say anything different to us, even though he's ascended back to heaven. He would say to us, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Cry out. Every time you hear some horrendous moral departure in our culture, and if you read it all, if you listen to it all, radio, TV, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Move. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel in chapter 24, it's a section there, the little, the little apocalypse is what it's called. Be on the alert. You do not know which day your Lord is coming. Some commentators, some of the highly respected ones, suggest that, that the Lord will return on a Lord's day. They say, look at the, first, look at the post-resurrection appearances. They were gathered together on the Lord's day. And he appeared to them. That he sent the Spirit on the 50th day, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. What Pentecost. They said, it's reasonable to believe that he will return on the Lord's day. Where do I want to be found if Jesus returns on the Lord's day? I want to be found among the people of God. I want to be, when, the, when, the, when the trumpet sounds and the skies part and he tears the roof off this place, I want to be found here with you. Worshiping and praising him and looking at his word and longing for his return and crying out to the Spirit to fill us in the likeness of Christ. That's why when Karen and I take some time off and go on vacation and, and our, I'm, not, I'm not, not in this place very often, but when I'm not, we do our best to be found among the people of God worshiping. Because it's good to be with the people of God. And if he returns when I'm gone from here, I want to be there where I should be. Be watchful. Peter again says the day of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. What type of people should we be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Let me tell you something. There are people who imagined at one point in their lives they were Christians and who spent the bulk of their lives habitually absent from the people of God. And when they wake up in, in eternity, they're going to be shocked and be shocked. God will not put people who didn't love the brethren enough while on earth to be found with the brethren. He will not put them in among the brethren for eternity. 
a profession of faith notwithstanding, a decision card notwithstanding, a membership notwithstanding. Part of being alert is being found faithful among the people of God. Second, stand firm. Another imperative verb. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Now, this... You're not talking about your profession of faith where you, where you come to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then somehow continue to have that. No. If you're saved here today, if you've really trusted Jesus Christ and become a follower of Christ, the devil cannot take that from you. Jesus said, you're in my hands. No one can pluck them out of my hands. And he said, in my hands are enveloped by the Father's hands. And no one can pluck them out of the Father's hands. And plus, in our new birth, the Holy Spirit came to live in us. While he hovered over Saul, the king, and he departed from Saul, and David saw that and said in Psalm 51, Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, for the new covenant believer... The Holy Spirit indwells us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. We have a triune, a Trinitarian safety in salvation. But the content of the gospel can be up for grabs. Stand firm. The social justice warriors and the Southern Baptist Convention would have you believe, and this is a quote from the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention, J.D. Greer, that the core of the gospel is helping those less fortunate than us. Jesus did call upon us to care for the poor. But make no mistake, brothers and sisters, the core of the gospel is the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is certainly to return in bodily fashion. Years ago, conservatives fought the liberals who were saying that the gospel is just about going out and feeding the poor and loving on people. And a, a prominent Methodist pastor who was in Shreveport when I served in Shreveport said, said, let me tell you what heaven is. Heaven is just loving people like Jesus loves. He said there is no such thing as a real hell. He said, heaven comes when we love people like Jesus loves. Now, that's a great call to living. If it's called out of the death, burial, Jesus Christ perfectly lived a life of sinlessness concerning the law of God. In the fullness of time, he came, willingly laid down his life, was beaten beyond recognition, Submitted to utter humiliation. Paul says the greatest of it being the painful, shameful death of the cross. Where on the cross, stripped naked in public, he took our sin. And he endured God's wrath for sin. He satisfied the divine justice of God by suffering and dying in our place. And he rose infallibly three days later, proving that everything he said was true of him was true. That everything he said he would do for us, he did. And everything he said was true of God was true. And everything he said of us was true. Infallibly so. That's the core of the gospel. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. The gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which you also stand. Stand firm in that gospel. Don't let anybody distract you from it. Don't let anybody suggest there's a substitute to it. Don't let anybody add to it. Don't let anybody take from it. It is the gospel. It's the gospel that Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 12. You've got to fight the fight of faith. Folks, we are not on a cruise ship on our way to heaven. We're on a battleship, 
My question I ask of me all the time, Bill, have you manned the battle station? I ask you, have you manned the battle station? We've always been at war. It just hasn't been this obvious. We've always been in hostile waters. It just hasn't been this obvious. Fight the good fight of faith. It's active. It's not passive. Paul said to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27, to stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if you're coasting, I plead with you, shift into gear. Some of you that spend time on rivers and lakes know well enough, and even even if you've been on a float, that if there's a current, You're going with the current by default if you're not intentionally going against the current with a motor or with oars or with your own hands. Coasting is deadly. We need to grow up. Satan, as I say, cannot take your salvation. But he will take anything you let him take other than that. Take your witness so that you, you, you wreck people respecting you enough that when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they listen to you. You can take your witness by how you live. You can take your joy. When you neglect the means of grace, when you do not feed upon the word, you do not fellowship in the spirit and prayer, you do not find yourself among the believers where you can be edified and encouraged and built up, prayed for, prayed with, ministered to, and joy leaves. You can take your power if you neglect the means of grace. And you won't live as more than a conqueror. You'll live as barely getting by. We need to stand firm. Paul said this in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, So, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Cling to the truth, not my tradition, not your tradition, not the way we've always done it before, but the traditions Paul taught, the, what, what looks like holy living in light of biblical truth. He said at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. It's this call to stand firm. The third one, act like men. Now this speaks specifically to men. We've been learning some things on Sunday night. If you've been attending, if you haven't been attending, let me encourage you to catch up. You can, you can watch the, uh, the previous sessions, one to five, on uh, Right Now Media under Love and Respect. We've been learning about the difference between male and female, man and woman. Fascinating things. Fascinating, drawn from the scriptures. Remember he says, not right, not wrong, just what? Different. And we're talking about men and women. But I'm going to tell you something. One of the banes on the church, and I saw this when I was growing up. I didn't understand it, but I saw it was that the church I grew up in was led by women. That's not sinful for women. The sin was the men. The sin was the men who capitulated. When I first arrived at First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana, I was preaching on Sunday nights. I looked up and it was mostly women. I said, where are the men? Well, they, they don't, they're not much on church at night. This included the deacons. 
I said, well, that's going to change. That's got to change. Because you see, when Paul calls upon the men in Corinth, act like men. That's not a call to some, some macho, chauvinistic uh, manliness out of the West. That's a biblical man. What happens when men act like biblical men? When men act like Christian men? First of all, their wives may have to make an adjustment. I saw that at Clinton, by the way. I saw that. I'll tell you something. The women who had led that church, when the men began to come under conviction as we prayed for them and, and visited with them and talked with them, and I started with the deacon body, I said, there's no need for us to meet as a group of deacons if you're not going to lead in worship in your attendance when we gather. And they began to step up and repent and bring fruit of their repentance. And the women, some of their wives who had led, resisted because the men had not led at home. They'd not led in the church. And they at first felt threatened because they felt like we were taking something away from them. But you know what happened? A beautiful thing happened. As the men began to wash their wives spiritually, <clears throat> began to lead their wives, began to love their wives as Christ loved the church, these became some of the most precious, servant-hearted women in the congregation from a whole different angle this time because their husbands were delighting in them. Their husbands were loving them. And I didn't, I didn't know what was going on then. Love and respect has taught me this, a little dance. As their husbands began to love their wives and love them and, and lead them, serve them, the wives began to respect their husbands. And as the husbands were respected by their wives, that was like saying sick em to a hound dog. It just continued to grow. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Act like men. It speaks of mature courage. It means that you believe as a man, if I don't lead in word, an example in the life and ministry of this congregation, I have no reason to expect anyone else to engage. There is no here am I, send so and so in the scripture. It's here am I, send me. And so this is a call to spiritual maturity. We're going to stop here because. We, we need to get back into this next Sunday morning. I'm going to challenge you in a couple of ways before we go. Be alert. You're sleepy. Slap yourself in the face a couple of times spiritually and wake up, okay? You're standing firm in the gospel. Go back and visit it a few times. Pray over it. Lord, make this that I know bounces around here. Grip, grip here. Grip my heart. Men, pray. God, help me to live as a mature Christ follower in a way that blesses my wife specifically, my children specifically, my grandchildren specifically, but also the women of our church, the children of our church, the grandchildren of our church, when they look at me, I want them to think I can count on him. Help me to live as a mature man, act like a man, to encourage and provoke my fellow men, my brothers in Christ, to love and good works. Corinth had a problem, had many problems. But in Paul, 
is taking this opportunity as one of the five commands he gives. All the others speak to men and women. This tells you a lot about Corinth. The men were not leading as spiritual godly men in Corinth. And parenthetically, that's how I think a lot of the nonsense in Corinth was allowed to be there. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you in Jesus' name. And as we're closing this letter out, Lord, let us hear this not only as Paul was speaking it to the Corinthians, but Father, our, our culture is so pagan that it makes Corinth look like Sunday school. Help us to hear this spoken to us. To be alert. Forgive us, Lord, when we get sleepy in the faith. Help us to be alert on our guard, aware. Help us to stand firm on the firm foundation of your word in the full armor of God. And Father, those of us who are men here, help us to act like men. A man after God's own heart. A man modeling Jesus to sinners. Help us, Lord, as we take this passage in next Lord's Day, if you let us live to see the Lord's Day, to, to consider this and commit to this in a new and fresh way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.